to the March 19th City Council meeting, the first day of spring, and uh, actually it looks like spring out there. For now. We'll celebrate that before the cold comes back. Uh, to begin this evening, I would ask for an invocation from Michael Maximowitz, and I hope you will correct me. Ch Ch Close enough. Oh, good. Which? Could you please stand? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members for uh, giving me the opportunity to give an invocation. Uh, I'd actually like to read the invocation tonight. And this is a uh, invocation of inspiration, uh, helping and serving others, some humor, and answered prayer. And uh, it's entitled, A Prayer Answered Professionally. An elderly woman hurried to the pharmacy to get medication, got back in her car, and found that she had locked her keys inside. She found an old rusty coat hanger left on the ground. She looked at it and said, I don't know how to use this. She bowed her head and asked God to send her someone to help her. Within five minutes, a beat up old motorcycle pulled up, driven by a bearded man uh, bike with a biker skull rag. He got off his cycle and asked if he could help. She said, yes. My daughter is sick, and I've locked, lost my, uh, locked my keys in my car. I must get home. Please, can you use this hanger to unlock my car? He said, sure. He walked over to the car, and in less than a minute, the car door was open. She hugged the man and through tears softly said, thank you, God, for sending me such a very nice man. The biker heard her little prayer and replied, Lady, <laughs> I am not a nice man. You see, I just got out of prison yesterday. I was in prison for car theft. The woman hugged the man, sobbing. Oh, thank God, you sent me a professional. God does move in mysterious ways. Amen. Thank you very much. And Kiki, would you lead us in the pledge tonight? Happy to. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Does council have any amendments to the agenda? Hearing or seeing none, we'll move on to a couple of proclamations. The first one is international Dark Sky Week. Whereas the aesthetic beauty and wonder of natural night sky is a public resource and a shared heritage of all humankind, and the experience of standing beneath a starry night sky inspires feelings of wonder and awe and encourages a growing interest in science and nature, especially among young people and out-of-area visitors within local communities, and whereas light pollution has significantly established economic and environmental consequences which result in significant impacts on the ecology and the human health of all communities, and whereas Dark Sky International, headquartered in Tucson, Arizona, has created International Dark Sky Week to raise awareness of light pollution and to encourage the protection of and enjoyment of dark skies and responsible outdoor lighting. Now, therefore, I, James Hammond, Mayor of the City of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, do hereby proclaim the week of April 2nd through April 8th, 2024, as International Dark Sky Week. And I understand James Fillmore is here to accept that? <coughs> Mayor and council members, hello again. 
Thank you very much for this third year in a row Dark Sky Week proclamation to help raise awareness of the splendor of the night sky and the risk caused by inappropriate lighting. Camping at Priest Lake still offers pretty good night skies. Camping at Farragut State Park, boating on Pend Oreille, or Southern Coeur d'Alene Lake give people a chance to see a bit of the Milky Way. Due to our proximity to Spokane, we're not going to be able to have a local dark sky reserve like Central Idaho has. But this issue is not just about night sky awe. From the publicity of these proclamations, I've given talks to area schools and private groups, and I'm frequently told about bright, non-shielded lights across streets or alleyways that bother people at night and affect their sleeping. These are more than nuisance issues to people. They, they are human health issues with excessive night lighting, and the effects on wildlife is non-trivial. Just a reminder, birds and insects are major pollinators, and both of these populations are in decline. Unfortunately, things can get worse. The area is continuing to grow, so it's not too late to act. Coeur d'Alene and Post Falls are getting more housing developments. Poorly designed LED lighting causes glare and light trespass. People buy what's familiar and available at the stores. Smart lighting ordinances do not hinder development. Rather, they enhance development by preventing poor lighting practices. And of course, excessive lighting simply wastes energy. Advanced features such as late night auto dimming can pay for themselves over time and are meaningful reductions for wildlife and night sky protection. I want to thank Dan, Dan English, who last year at this occasion agreed to speak with me, which we have done. Those chats have led to initial conversations with city staff. I look forward to being a resource for city, <laughs> city staff to develop modern, smart code amendments which provide safety and protect human health, wildlife habitat, and the awesome night sky. Again, for myself, the local populace, and the entire dark sky community, thank you for this proclamation. Thank you, James. We have another proclamation uh, regarding the uh, week of the young child. And uh, I'll read some of it. Whereas the Idaho Association for the Education of Young Children are celebrating the week of the young child, April 6 to April 12, 2024, and whereas we are working to promote and inspire high quality early childhood experiences for our state's youngest children that can provide a foundation of learning and success for children in Coeur d'Alene. And whereas public policies that support early learning for all young children are crucial to young children's futures and <clears throat> to the prosperity of our society. Now, therefore, I, James Hammond, Mayor of the City of Coeur d'Alene, do hereby proclaim the week of April 6th through April 12th as the week of the young child. And I understand that we have Tanya Sears, uh, Idaho Association for the Education of Young Children Board Chair, and Denise Ort, the Northern Chapter Rep, here to receive that. I don't see anybody coming forward. Okay. Well, thank you, Tanya and De Denise. <coughs> Okay, we have an update from our uh, fire chief, uh, Chief Greif, and Deputy Chief Jeff Sells, and EMS Officer Stephen Jones. And Jeff, my son says he still owes you a hat. <laughs> Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. <clears throat> Before I get started, we would like to thank you for the opportunity tonight to join you at the council meeting to share some hopefully useful information with you regarding the operations of your fire department. With me this evening, we have Deputy Chief of Operations Jeff Sells, as well as our EMS officer Steve Jones. So as your fire department administration team, one of our most important roles is to constantly measure and reevaluate our service delivery and always look for opportunities to enhance it. As we approach a very important year ahead of us, we will be coming to you very soon, seeking your approval for yet a third general obligation bond in May of 2025. With that comes several difficult decisions that may include 
the replacement of our fire apparatus fleet, fire station upgrades and expansions, and possibly added resources. As you know, our most valuable asset continues to be our people, but they also have the greatest impact to our budget since they are an ongoing expense versus the capital one-time expense. So when we come to you during a city budget process, we want you to have the comfort level and confidence that when we ask for staffing, um, that this decision will be driven by service delivery measurements that you'll see tonight, the need to enhance safety conditions on the fire ground, and overall operation of operational efficiency on emergency incidents. Ideally forecasting this ahead of time and coming to you with not only an ask, but um, a sustainable plan to go with it. We're confident that our measurements along with the recently completed GIS study from the IAFF that we'll be able to provide you with this objective information to support our future recommendations to you. So tonight we're going to provide you with some response analytics that include response times in each of the zones in the city. That includes, includes the calls for service by each station or company as we know it, unit availability in these zones, as well as unit hour utilizations. Last year you saw a great value in adding a third ALS ambulance to your fire department. So we'll also show you the impact that this resource has had in just the short 12 months that it's been in service four days a week. Last Tracking a lot of these statistics is a new reporting software that we implemented in October. So it gives us some extra ability to track a lot of these numbers that we didn't necessarily have the ability to track prior. So speaking of last year, it was our busiest year. Um, we cleared 10,022 incidents, which is a department record. 78% of those were EMS incidents. And I throw in a caveat that 113 of those were reports of cardiac arrest. Um, and then EMS Officer Jones will kind of elaborate on some of that during his presentation. 22% of those calls were fire incidents. And those are broken down to a couple of different areas. 8% um, of those were just assistance uh, calls, so the majority of those are essentially just lifting, <coughs> lift assists, uh, just helping physically disabled people, and then there's a variety of other uh, calls that we go on, some animal rescues. If they don't really know how to code a call, they usually put it into this category. So 4% were fire alarms. Uh, 8% were other fires to include car fires, boat fires, uh, wildland fires, <clears throat> and then 2% were structure fires. And then I throw another caveat in there that we received 171 ins or calls for reported fire in a, in a building. And that includes the mutual aid responses that we, uh, that we provide. So last year, 2.8% of our calls were uh, we received mutual aid, and 2.6% of the time we actually gave mutual aid. So our engine or battalion chief responded to incidents outside of the city. So to break this down by uh, the volume within the zones and the travel time, you've probably heard a lot of references to NFPA 1710. And it essentially establishes kind of the parameters that we try to comply with regarding uh, staffing, um, shoot times, which are the time we receive the alarm till we're actually rolling out the door, and then that travel time. Our goal with 1710 is to have a four minute or less travel time. So looking at this map, uh, the downtown area, F3A, we're doing pretty good. It, our average travel time was three minutes and 52 seconds. Now these only include emergent responses, which is one of the new things that we're able now to track with their new reporting software is to separate out the low acuity calls from the high acuity calls. So we know when it matters, our, <clears throat> our travel time downtown average is three minutes, 52 seconds. Um, 
the east part of town, three minutes 27, Tubbs Hill. Uh, there's an asterisk by that because one of the things that we had to do were to be able to identify calls that actually occurred within that zone. And Tubbs Hill has always been a difficult place to be able to track calls because the addressing of Tubbs Hill was always putting it in a different zone. So that was one of the things that we're able to fix. So we're better able to track those calls on Tubbs. Uh, Armstrong Park, not really a surprise that our travel time uh, up to Armstrong Park is going to be, you know, quite extensive. And then the calls on the lake, we don't necessarily track the, uh, um, the travel time because there's a lot that goes into those. And those five incidents that you see here on Coeur d'Alene Lake are incidents that started on the lake and remained on the lake. So when we talk about the use of the fire boat, the vast majority of the calls that, that start on the lake end up on the shore and then they just get dispatched based on whatever um, land zone they, uh, they land in. So that number is, is a hard one also to track. Chief, I have yeah. a quick question. When you talk about these incidents, are these uh, lights and sirens or is there a difference there? So these incidents are all the incidents that occur within those zones. But the travel time that I, that I listed are just the travel times for the emergent calls. So there's usually about a 55-45 split between emergent and the low acuity calls. So we're able to weed out the low acuity calls, those travel times, so that it doesn't skew our numbers. Because our, our interest is more in when it's an emergent call, what our travel time is. But I don't necessarily, we don't necessarily send every, you know, all the apparatus lights and siren to every call. Okay, thank you. So this uh, second part of the map is just the area north of town. Um, we did some modifications to these zones this last year to help try to shift some of the call volume from engine two to engine four, and I'll get into that here in just a minute. But you start seeing some of our response zones start crawling over that four minute mark. And for this zone over here, F3C, <clears throat> these calls up in here are what starts to drive that, that travel time up. The hospital district, F3H, this one here you see is 358, but there's also a lot of calls that occur in that particular zone. And what we're finding is that incidents that are occurring south of I-90, uh, get my mouse to work right, in this F3H zone, our travel times are, are quite longer. I mean, trying to get over the bridge is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, <clears throat> F3I is kind of in the middle, up by the fairgrounds. It's kind of just that middle zone, and we're doing good there. I grouped these three together because these are three of our Station 4 uh, zones. And we start creeping up above that four minute, and what's driving that number up are calls over here in this corner. So this little piece up here, again, is one of our, our difficult areas to make our four minute response time. And in the Atlas Corridor, we just started tracking these calls in June. And our travel time down there is about six and a half minutes. So incidents by uh, fire company, engine two, again, was the, uh, the uh, busiest. And then I included some shoot times in, for EMS incidents and fire incidents. And again, referring back to 1710, um, one of the requirements or recommendations for getting out the door after we receive the alarm for an EMS call is uh, under a minute, and for a fire call is a minute 20. That's pretty quick. A lot of things have a affect that station design. Um, you know, if you're at ones and you're trying to slide the pole, it sometimes can seem like it goes faster, but it generally doesn't. Um, but I did include here the colored uh, um, times, and they indicate the company with the fastest shoot time. 
since we started tracking it last year. So for instance, station two blue shift held the record at 43 seconds. So it's like firefighters like being a little competitive. <laughs> so they, uh, some of this is all kinds of bragging rights for them, but this is, this is the type of environment and the culture that we, you know, that we strive to have. And this third number here, availability, this is a number we also watch very closely. That NFPA 1710 standard says that we should be able to make 90% of all the calls in our first due areas. So we look at engine two last year, they only made 82% of those. Engine three, 89. Engine four just barely creeped over 90. Uh, the ladder was at 87. The ladder is a little bit of a unique scenario because it gets tasked with a lot of extra responses in the city just because of its uniqueness. Structure fires, again, we went to or we received 171 uh, structure fire responses. This includes our mutual aid. Within the city, we had 15 confirmed uh, working structure fires. And essentially what that is is a fire that's made it into the structure. And it's, it weeds out like the, the appliance fires, the mattress fires, and all the other little fires that you know, we typically will go on. So 15 working fires. Seven of those went to a second alarm which is not uncommon for us, the way our deployment model works. And then we had one that went to a third alarm. Our average response time to a reported structure fire was five minutes, 38 seconds. This includes the shoot time and the travel time. So that number is actually pretty good. <clears throat> Do you have a quick question? Yeah. Second alarm, what is the difference between a second alarm and a third alarm? So our first alarm puts 14 um, folks on a scene. So a battalion chief, two engines, a ladder truck, and two ambulances. The second alarm adds another battalion chief, the duty chief gets paid, inspectors, two more engines, and another ambulance. And then a third alarm gets us another battalion chief, three more engines, and then a support vehicle. So and we build out these alarms for you know, not just structure fires, but for um, incidents that we could consider like a mass casualty or um, aircraft accidents. We, you know, we build out these response plans to be able to add additional resources to those as well. Thank you. So our average time to get our full first alarm on scene, those 14 folks, is 10 minutes, 37 seconds. 1710 um, recommends that at eight minutes. So we're, we're a little behind on that. And they also recommend 17 firefighters on the first alarm for a low, uh, low hazard structure fire, so like a sing, single family residence. Where the numbers get a little bit more interesting is NFPA 1710 also recommends that we put 43 firefighters on the first alarm of a high rise fire. And that's obviously not the most practical thing in our scenario, but we try to, you know, do what we can. So with regards to uh, the new ambulance, Medic 34, we put it in service uh, March 1st last year. And this, these numbers represent essentially a six month picture of how this ambulance has affected um, the system. So you can kind of look back here and most notably, the numbers I wanted to point out were these percentages. One of the things we do take pride in is ensuring that our ambulances are responding to mostly uh, medical calls. Some other departments will, will wholesale their ambulances to a lot of fire calls and this and that. We, tr we really try to keep our ambulances focused on just responding to EMS calls. So when we added Medic 34 here, 31 and 32, our other two ambulances, their call volume decreased by 194 calls. But you look here, we were able to absorb a significant number of, of more calls. So this new ambulance had a lot of value in being able to absorb more calls and still reduce the number of calls for our other two ambulances. So again, 
it, or what we want to demonstrate is the ability of this new ambulance to close the gap. So in 21 and 22, you can see 8% of all our EMS calls, the ambulance had to come from outside of the city. So since we put Medic 34 in service, and again, this is just looking at the times that they're in service, we're down to 43 calls last year. So 1% of our calls had to be handled by an ambulance outside of the city. Chief? Yes. Um, the, so the ambulance service is done by the EMS, and it is countywide. Is there any line of demarcation between, I mean, are these calls just to the city, or are they including calls outside our area? So our ambulances will respond outside of the city mm -hmm. as well. Um, and it is a county ambulance service, so they will respond into the city. Our, in a further slide here where I, where I demonstrate that um, our unit hour utilization, as that goes up, our response times um, increase, and our goal is eight minutes mm -hmm. with those. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the last slide, if I bounce to the end, it uh, <clears throat> the new ambulance has been able to drive down that response time to those calls. So I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Oh, that was good. I mean, I, I just uh, appreciate it. It's just the... You know, their call volume to the city went down by 50%. Nice. You know, the uh, what I did add here was Medic 34 did assume a non-emergency transport, a fairly frequent one, frequent one that we do from the hospital to the hospice house. Um, that Medic 51 had been doing. So we just, we picked that up on, on four days that mm -hmm. Medic 34 is in service, and it's made a big big difference. Because we, we try to keep their ambulances in their areas as much as we can, you know, just like they try to keep our ambulances in the city as much as they can. So unit hour utilization um, essentially is just a, a mathematical formula to help determine system stress um, calculated by total number of incidents divided by the total number of hours that unit was in service. And I'll show you some calculations here directly. It is an industry standard. For fire context, again, we try to have a UHU of a 0.1, which means our apparatus can get to 90% of their calls. Um, in EMS, we gauge it on achieving that eight-minute uh, response time. So. Prior to uh, Medic 34 being put in service, our UHUs were fairly high. So we were having a, a problem. You can take a look. Last year, we had creeped over that eight-minute mark. By adding the new ambulance, we've now been able to crawl back under that eight-minute mark. So it, that in, it, in and of itself is a, is a great success. So with that, I'll... Uh, Stand for any questions? Can you explain the difference between a EMS response time at eight minutes and a fire at four? Travel time of four minutes. Travel time is EMS two? No, travel. the response time for EMS when you're, um, I guess, let me try to figure out. So the, that four minute travel time for fire is based on a fire incident. So those those times are typically determined based on if you have a structure fire. Now, it also does apply to EMS because with our engines, we want them there within that, that four minute time for early AED, um, CPR, this and that. The assumption in 1710 is that all the engines are basic life support and all the ambulances are advanced life support. So when you read the standard, it's BLS on scene within four minutes, ALS on scene within eight minutes. Now, we're a little different in that we have paramedics on the engine um, most of the time. So we're, we meet that, that's, that standard, but um, you know, just trying to, keep the, trying to keep our ambulance response times to, to less than eight minutes. And one other thing, just clarification, you keep referring to 1710. Can you give me the global it's, picture of that? So NFPA 1710 is a standard that helps fire departments um, determine staffing levels, uh, 
shoot times, response times, um, the travel times. It, it essentially just kind of paints a picture of, of what the ideal fire department um, will provide. It's, uh, it was referred to in the, what the chief you know, talked about, that IFF study. That's 1710 has referred to it in a lot, in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, our new reporting software, we were able to take some of the statistics from that and then try to recreate it. Because obviously, with any data, you should be able to recreate it to get the, you know, the same results. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jeff, uh, the response times are just so, so important, not only to your department, but to the whole city as a whole. Um, <clears throat> when you, I understand that those are determined at a national level. It would be great to see what we've done in the last 10 years, how, because I know you've done a lot to improve the response time, so maybe in the future, something like that. But also, um, if you can pick another city in Idaho that's similar, how are we comparable? My assumption is we're better. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's a, that's a good question. I don't have, I don't really have an answer for that. So each of the, every fire department or fire district is, you know, managed a little differently in their operations. And I would have to see what their, you know, what Oh, and how they collect data. Yeah. Sure. That makes sense. Well, we think you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Especially if you're sick, everybody wants, I mean, that's great. You're doing great. Thanks, Jeff. All right, thank you. <clears throat> My turn, I guess. Uh, honorable Mayor, Council Members, <clears throat> um, I just wanted to go over a little bit of cardiac arrest data for you. Um, and these are statistics from 2023. And like Chief Sells had mentioned earlier, um, we were called for service for 113 reported cardiac arrests. Of those 113, 60 of those actually turned out to be a true cardiac arrest in nature. We were able to regain, to gain return of spontaneous circulation 52% of the time out of those 60 calls. The national average is 25 to 30%. 25 of these 60 patients received bystander CPR for an average of 41% of the time. The national average for bystander CPR is 40.2%. So we're doing pretty good there, but we still have some room for improvement. The Coeur d'Alene Fire Department provided CPR training to over 190 citizens in the Coeur area in 2023. This next slide here, I want to talk about a new program that we collaboratively partnered with all of the partnering EMS agencies and Kootenai Health in regards to trying to get some of the most sick stroke patients from Kootenai Health to Spokane because Kootenai Health uh, was, is not able to treat certain types of strokes. So we were trying to figure out a way that we could get these patients emergent transport from our hospital to definitive care over in Spokane. And we call these 37, deco, 37 deltas or 37 echoes. And what this is, is our ambulances, will get, they'll, they'll tone out the closest paramedic ambulance to the hospital. And that ambulance will actually respond lights and sirens <coughs> to the hospital to pick up these patients in the emergency room and then transport them lights and sirens to Spokane, decreasing the overall time uh, that it used to take, which was over about an hour to an hour and 20 minutes. And so we're able to now respond emergently to these calls at Kootenai Health for service and get these patients to definitive care much, much faster. Um, the some of the goals of this program, like I said, were emergent responses to Kootenai Health to Spokane. Uh, turnaround time in the emergency room of less than 10 minutes. So our goal is once we get to Kootenai Health, be in and out in under 10 minutes and on the road to, to Spokane. Um, we've had the uh, privilege of transporting seven of these patients so far uh, since we implemented this in December of 2023. 
And I'm happy to tell you that the Coeur d'Alene Fire Department average turnaround time at the hospital for these patients is 6.6 .6 minutes. So we're beating the mark. And the goal of this, obviously the big goal of this is to uh, increase better patient outcomes. So we're making that happen as well. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a question? Steve, one of the things that we learned, I think it was last year, when you talk about better patient outcomes, tell us a little bit about the triage you're doing now before they even get to the hospital. Um, oh, are you, are you referring to time-sensitive emergencies? Mm -hmm. um, I've got some data for you on okay. that here in just a I'll moment, be, if, okay. if you don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind. So let's talk a little bit about the billables and the money that we're able to generate through our EMS system. Uh, that comes back to the city of Coeur d'Alene. So in 2023, we had a total of 5,026 total billable EMS calls, which generated a gross of $4,057,750. Of that $4 million, 62% of that is paid by Medicare locally here. 13% uh, Medicaid, 21% is commercial insurance, and 4% is self-pay. And then I wanted to break down a little bit of what we actually are, what the system, the EMS system is actually able to recover based on Medicare and Medicaid. So the average um, Medicare payment is only 49.2% of what's actually billed to the patient. Medicaid pays an average of 39.9%. So the total revenue contracted to Coeur d'Alene Fire Department in 2023, we received $2,097,923. All right, now let's talk about some of the time-sensitive time sensitive emergency stuff. So as uh, Council Member Wood was saying, um, about a year ago I came before you and talked about a new certification that we received here in Kootenai County as partners with our Kootenai County Emergency Medical Services. And that was the Idaho State uh, Time Sensitive Emergency Certification. So I can happy to tell you that we're crushing it. <laughs> um, your Coeur d'Alene Fire Department continues to strive for clinical excellence and leads the county in the following. So we've ran the most EMS calls again this year. Um, we have the fastest shoot times for EMS responses. Uh, throughout the three ALS agencies. We have the shortest on-scene times for all time-sensitive emergencies. So for strokes, heart attacks, trauma, and sepsis, they have different timelines that they'd like to see us be on-scene less than a certain certain amount of time. So I'm happy to report to you that we, we lead, uh, the city of Coeur d'Alene, our ambulance crews, and firefighters lead the county in the shortest on-scene times in all four categories. Um, we also lead uh, in the shortest turnaround time. So this is the time that it takes once we get to the hospital to turn around and get back in service. So we are also leading uh, in, that, in that benchmark as well. Did that kind of answer your time-sensitive emergency well, question? What I recall is there, there is a real collaboration with the team at the hospital on, on what the actual condition is, yeah. the emergency, and, and then they're able to triage better before you even get there. Correct, so what we're doing in the field is when we, when we diagnose a stroke in the field or a heart attack or a trauma or a sepsis patient, when we, we call and give a radio report to the hospital, letting them know that we're coming and give them specific uh, patient information. And then on these time-sensitive emergencies, we actually would call like what's called a stroke alert. And that tells them that this is a serious patient that's going to need more hands than just maybe what they have available currently in the ER. So it, by us reporting these calls early, it gets the right people down to the emergency room to help better take care of these patients much faster. That's fantastic. So it's making a huge difference. And aren't you, isn't our department kind of only the, the only ones in the area actually doing that? No, our whole system, our whole EMS system uh, is got the time sensitive emergency certification That's from the great. state. So, Jeff, I have a question for you. I know sometimes you guys you cover Harrison. You actually leave the city and go Correct. the long distances. Is that averaged into the call times and all the, the that, or is it just? You want to kind of 
Sorry. I'll, I'll start yeah. it off, though. But yes, uh, Councilman uh, McEvers, you're correct. The, the Coeur d'Alene Ambulance, um, we'll say Medic 31, which is at Station 1, its primary response area is downtown city area, but they're also the first paramedic ambulance to go south of the river towards Worley. They also travel uh, down to Harrison, sometimes almost to St. Mary's, and then that ambulance can also sometimes be called all the way up to the 4th of July Pass. So our ambulances within the city, like we said earlier, they do go outside of the city, but Medic 31 definitely covers a large majority south of us as well and to the east. I was just thinking the impact when they are gone, and that's not a eight or 10 or 12 minute thing, that's 20 minutes or a half hour or longer sometimes, yeah? Yeah, we, there's a um, set order of cover units. So like when Medic 31 goes south of town, Medic 32 covers and then Medic 34, which is why those zones are designed the way they are. Gotcha. It helps, it actually just creates a little bit more definitive area for backup units and it includes backup engines too for instance engine two being the busiest engine um, when it's out there's a cover unit that will have to come over and, and cover that well then that engine is out of position so if there's a call there then there's another cover unit so it's a um, that's why we strive to keep you know like our engines in their first two areas and then the ambulances trying to keep those UHUs low which 34 added another resource so you know now we have two cover units in the court in Coeur d'Alene as opposed to just the one that we had had okay so, so like when you have to go to Spokane you have to cover that right correct okay thank you thank you Mr. yes sir oh. yep. I okay. called on Kiki yep. you be quiet now oh. <laughs> well, I, he was answered okay all right one at, the, one at a time, one at a time. <laughs> you're just so popular I am, I think today at the Mayor's State of the City address, one of the pieces of information that he shared is that the demographics of the people moving here, the highest percentage is 60 years and older. You're talking about running a bond in 2025. How are you accounting for the projections for what I'm assuming, uh, assuming the cardiac arrest group is, <laughs> is probably higher in that? <laughs> I don't. Hey, I, no. I, I'm in the same. I'm in the same boat. Okay. I'm just saying that. How does that play into when you're projecting what your needs are going to be? So a lot of that we would work. We work with collaboratively with Kootenai County Emergency Medical Services, and so that's how we were able to see that there was a need over the last several years, and that's how we were able to implement that Medic 34. So Medic 34 uh, is doing uh, much better. Uh, as far as their call volume and their revenue that's being brought in. And so there is a timeline for that to hopefully be able to go to a seven day a week ambulance. And it sounds like since we're doing so much business with that ambulance that maybe that timeline is gonna be moved up slightly. So that's probably the next big thing that we're gonna see ambulance and paramedic coverage wise. Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to drill down back a couple of slides on the um, the money part of it. And um, speaking of Medicare population, and, uh, but I see that the, you know from a provider's point of view, the, the Medicare pays an average of about 49 percent. Medicaid pays an average of about 40 percent. Now I do know on Medicaid that providers are not able to, allowed to charge any co-pays, anything on top of that, but Medicare often, there's some kind of a co-pay or any, do you know if that's any way figured uh, into this? I, I don't have that answer for you, okay. simply because we don't deal with the billing side of things, yeah. so yeah. I was able to get these numbers from our EMS system, but I'd be happy to be able to try to find that answer out for you. Yeah, well, just curious if yeah. there's, yeah, because, and again, because Medicaid won't allow any extra billing, which is correct. Right, but, yeah. um, um, and I guess part of the moral of that, go after the Medicare group, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? 
Seeing no other questions, thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that what is most important is that these statistics will help us evaluate our next steps as we move forward in terms of uh, our fleet and uh, our facilities. Thank you. Well, thanks for having us tonight. We appreciate it. We have a couple of folks wishing to share some comments with us tonight. Uh, when I call your name, please come forward and introduce yourself. The first would be Janice Daly. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and my council members. I'm Janice Daly, and I was here, I think, last September to talk to you about the street noise, the vehicles, and their modified um, conditions making so much noise in the city. I live in a high rise downtown, been there about a year, used to live off of Lakeshore Drive, and it's extremely menacing. I'm sure you know what it sounds like. I have a phone full of uh, sounds taped for you, so I know you know what they are. But anyway, I'm here actually to thank you so much for going ahead with changing the code and trying to assist us in possibly taking care of the problem. And I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a retired police officer myself. I'm not trying to give more work to the police department. However, we do need your assistance. And I'm actually inviting any one of you in the council or the city to come up to my unit and spend half an hour, an hour there one evening and just hear it. And like on my walk here, I heard probably 10 of them or 15 of them last night from dinner hour, probably a hundred of them. And they're all modified. It's trucks, motorcycles, and those small little cars. And I've talked to the people working downtown and people visiting and other tenants and residents in the town. No one likes it. It's a burden to all of us. And I'm more than willing to work with you to make a difference. I don't want to make it hard on you. I want to make it easier on you. And if you get the vantage point from where we are, I'm sort of at Northwest Boulevard where it splits with Sherman. Perfect view. I can see exactly where you could place a car going either direction to catch them. And I, again, I really appreciate you for taking us seriously because it's so annoying. Every evening during dinner, it's just obnoxious. But anyway, thank you very much and thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you, Janice. Barb Lachet. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. I'm not used to talking in front of people, so excuse me. <laughs> I'm here because, um, oh, am I supposed to say something? Please. <laughs> oh, my name's Barb Letchett, and I live here in Coeur d'Alene. I'm responding here to res sort of to respond and reflect on the letter that I read, and then my turn. Um, column of the Corlean Press a while back from Mr. Gookin and it's about the historic district of our town. If you don't mind, I'd just like to read it because I, my mind scatters and I don't want to be here all night and I know you don't want me here all night. So um, I appreciate the My Turn article in the press by Con Councilman Gookin. However, I wished it would have been during the comprehensive plan review Back then, I sent a letter to the mayor and council expressing my views regarding the history of downtown being developed away. <clears throat> the downtown is the origin of the city of Coeur d'Alene. Those buildings are the physical history for our residents, children, retirees, visitors, and those who have lived here for decades. As I expressed before, Tourists usually go to places for quaint, unique qualities and experiences. We have a, 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 excuse me, we have a museum and statues, but the shops from back in the day are an immersion of what Coeur d'Alene was like. Unfortunately, during the period of rebirth, development was focused on making money, which isn't wrong, but attention to the historic downtown was left out. Thankfully, some entrepreneurs kept storefronts of the period and created nice businesses. 
Regarding the design committee meeting with the Marriott development is another case where residents are left out of the process until it's too late. No wonder people are upset with the happenings sometimes of our city. The invitation to the public for this meeting, in my opinion, was a sham. I was so impressed with the concerns and comments made by us in attendance, even though we were basically told it was a rubber stamp on the development. <clears throat> this design would be perfect for the East Sherman development. In the future, why can a notice be placed in the press, like others, at the very beginning of a developer interested in a property? Creating workshops for interested re residents would bring forth ideas, concerns, and suge suggestions of the property usage instead of a developer telling us what they will do. Lastly, and it's probably more on my part, I'm not sure residents are clear of the process. Who's in charge of the property purchases, development plans, etc. How can residents be involved when it isn't clear how, when it isn't clear how, especially when people have interest about general development or historic downtown? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to announcements, City Council. Of, yes, Mr. Mayor, I or would just. Council. <laughs> Did you call me or him? No, I called you. Okay, well, good, because I was going to give you a big compliment. <laughs> I um, thought you did a wonderful job today at the State of the City address, and it was, it was very informative. It was fun. Um, you're very witty when you want to be. <laughs> anyway, I really enjoyed it. So nice work, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you very much. Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, you, you did a much better job than last year. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I try to improve each year. You know. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to just uh, mention a couple of things uh, on my, my list. So we know that something to talk about what Ms. Lechut was talking about, which is um, downtown and I was saying the, the downtown parking thing and height restrictions that I was talking about, as well as billboards in the city and the NIC rezone. I assume all those are moving forward. Thank you. And uh, also wanted to talk about the noise downtown. We had a gentleman talk about that last time when we had our ordinance. And he mentioned something about signs that would flash if the noise got too loud. Is that something the city could look into? I don't know. If that, I, I mean, I guess if, if that's a thing. He seemed to say it was a thing in some places. I don't know if, that's, if we want to look into that and maybe see if we could partner with Downtown Association on getting something that would alert people when things were getting loud? I don't know. I'll if bet not, you. we'll develop that and oh. bring that forward as a patent. Outstanding. <laughs> <As a> patent. <laughs> um, the other thing, the other question I had, I was contacted by someone, and I think all the council was, regarding the, pro the proclamations we do. And I really don't know, I mean, and I don't think any of us know what the process is on how a proclamation gets set up here. Um, I didn't have any issues with the ones tonight, but he, uh, the, the person who ha uh, contacted me had an issue with one of the organizations. And I really don't know how we can respond to that when we don't really know what the process is for submitting a proclamation. And I don't know if we're looking at these things and saying, okay, so this organization, the, the week of the child, all that stuff sounds really good, but the organization is involved in some stuff that he didn't like, that was politically charged. So. Is there anything we can do about that, or what, what is the process? Does anyone know? Well, actually, I would suggest that the first step would be that uh, Renata pretty much uh, oversees the um, uh, request for those kinds of proclamations, and uh, maybe um, Renata and I can visit, and then we can get some kind of a report to you uh, in, in terms of the process for that. Very good. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, Dan. Well, just since he mentioned the, maybe the flashing lights for noise is I would just say on the upside is that, <clears throat> you know, live in Coeur d'Alene Place and just recently, well, they, you know, put the uh, flashing lights for the crosswalks 
on the circle there, and then also a brand new one that's just going in by Woodland Middle School, and that's a very active, I mean, kids zipping across, so, and they're working and they're tweaking the, the light, and look today like maybe they were giving them the drill on how to use it. I saw people out there with a the group of kids, so anyway, those are, I mean, really cost-effective safety measures, so we should keep going on all that we can, so. Thank you. I don't have an announcement, but I did want to thank the council today uh, for coming today to the yes. state of the city. And uh, I said earlier that I thought that this group on the council were all hardworking and contribute substantially to the efforts of governing this city. And I wanted to emphasize that again tonight. I very much appreciate all of you. We don't always agree. That's good. That's good. Disagreement is the best way to kind of filter through what's right and what's wrong for the city. And uh, I, I very much appreciate the work and the different uh, strengths that you all bring to this. Thank you, folks. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move for approval of the consent calendar as presented, including resolution 24018. Second. We have a motion to second. Will the clerk take the roll, please? Mr. Mr. Mayor, oh, just one, yes. one thing I want to point out, because it was mentioned during public comments, is there is a public hearing on April 16th for the appeal of the uh, Design Review Committee's decision on the Marriott Hotel. So making that public. Thank you. Will the clerk take the roll, please? Miller. Aye. McEvers. Yes. Gookin. Yep. English. Yes. Wood. Yes. Evans. Yes. Motion carries. We next have a resolution regarding a memorandum of understanding with ITD. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for putting up with me for a while tonight. Got three presentations tonight. So uh, the first one is a MOU with ITD and a supplemental agreement with Welch Comer Engineers for design of the signals and ADA upgrades on government way. So in August of 2023, you approved uh, an agreement with Welch Comer to begin design and submit a funding application to the state. Um, by beginning the design, it gave us more points uh, towards that. And in the end, we ended up scoring second um, uh, out of the list of applicants. And we were awarded $4.826 million uh, for this project. Uh, this uh, image here shows the signals that we're going to be looking at along Government Way, stretching from Harrison all the way up to Prairie. Prairie will be a joint effort with the city of Hayden because we only own half of that signal. Um, but this project essentially will be upgrading the equipment in the signals, adding left turn arrows where needed, um, up Upgrading the ADA facilities like the ped ramps and push buttons and the crosswalk uh, signals. Um, and it will be providing communication between all these. So with this, we are, as part of Welch Comer's contract, they are subcontracting to iTerrace from Spokane, who will uh, develop programming for these so that we can efficiently move cars up and down government way. I actually drove it this weekend and hit greens all the way up it and it's because I was lucky. Um, <laughs> those signals don't talk to each other. Um, I've heard people complain that they catch every red and we have them programmed wrong. Well they're not programmed, they're just on time. They, each one is acting independently of each other. So when we're done with this, hopefully we'll have a coordinated corridor that will move traffic a lot more efficiently um, and it'll be more friendly to people with disabilities as well. So with that, I would ask you to approve the MOU with ITD and the supplemental agreement with Welch Comer. Questions? Woody? A couple of them. On the intersections, is there any structural or the right turn lanes going to be widened, sidewalks narrowed, anything physical that's going to change the amount of space? 
narrower lanes? No, no. no. Uh, all the lanes will remain the same. Um, the only thing that will change physically on the ground is ped ramps will be um, upgraded ADA. So there may be flattened slopes on those or add the truncated domes, detectable warning strips, those kinds of things. Okay. Uh, the other one was on the program you just mentioned, somebody's going to write that or are they going to manage it? Oh, the program, uh, they are going to write that for us. So similarly, we've got one uh, on Sherman that moves traffic. It is kind of disabled right now because of our uh, computer issue that we had. Uh, we'll get that back up and running. But Northwest Boulevard also, uh, we paid somebody to develop programming for that. So um, it'll be, we'll have it. Um, and we can possibly tweak it, but we will probably end up having to pay someone else to kind of redesign it in a few years. Like after three to five years, we might take another look at it and see how it's moving traffic and maybe have to develop a new program for it, depending on how traffic's moving. So the one we have on Northwest Boulevard right now going over the bridge, is that somebody else's writing? Yes. And but and they control it we don't really control no we it. control it but they just wrote what uh which signal uh the delay between them kind of thing okay. thank you okay how would council wish to act on this mr mayor i'll make a motion to approve resolution number 24 dash 019 approval of a memorandum of understanding with the idaho transportation department for government way strategic initiatives funding and supplement to the professional services agreement with Welsh Comer. Second. We we'll have a motion and a second for the discussion. Seeing none, will the clerk take the roll, please? McEvers. Yes. Gookin. Yes. English. Yes. Yeah. Wood. Yes. Evans. Yes. Miller. Aye. Motion carries. Now uh, sewer overflow. Yes, uh, so this grant is a much smaller one, but this is through the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. Um, this image here shows where we have got two catch basins out on uh, Hill Drive um, that are connecting into our sanitary sewer system, which is a no-no. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant doesn't want to treat our stormwater, though they do a very effective job of it. <laughs> Um, so we went ahead and uh, we submitted a letter of interest to DEQ in January of 2023. Um, I don't know why this is a multi-step process, but once uh, they said, yes, go ahead and submit the application. So we submitted an application in November of 2023. And now we are accepting the award, or I'm hoping that you will accept the uh, the award of uh, $34,450. Um, actually, 31000 of it will come from DEQ. There is a 20% match for us. Um, and we are um, looking at using HMH to develop a plan on how to best take care of this stormwater. So with that, I would stand for any questions. Yeah. Chris, how does it, <clears throat> the, the, the wastewater system is a closed system, how does stormwater get into our wastewater system? I don't know how the decisions were made when they were made. I, I can see why it was done in this location because they probably had a flooding problem because it's a low area. It's, it's not... Uh, we don't have a stormwater system out there where they could pipe it to somewhere else. So actually it was an, an, an intentional effort to channel that water. Correct. And we've had a okay. few more of these around the city that we've taken care of recently. We just took care of one last year um, that was connected to sewer and we put it into some dry wells. And um, so we want to do something similar with this. Uh, create some way that we can dispose of the stormwater without causing any impacts on the residents there. Thank you. Woody? So for $31,000, what do we get? We get design? It won't be a full design, but it'll be a concept of what they can do because this is considered a planning grant. Um, 
the first time we submitted something, they said, well, it looks like you're going out to bid with this, and this is a planning grant, so we had to tone it down a little bit. So we're going to get most of the way there. We just won't be able to get to the finish line. I always think of stormwater, as we've tried different things, is just a basic grassy swale. Is this more than that, do you think, or does the planners have to figure it out? Um, they will probably look at some options, whether we have a grassy swale and a dry well, or we use some sort of uh, filter or something like that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Following up on that, Chris, uh, so will you be back? I mean, after the design is done, are we going to have to fund whatever they're doing? Well, it depends. If it's something simple enough that we can do in-house, uh, we'll just do it with our own forces okay. but otherwise we might have to come back with our contract excellent thank you <clears throat> seeing no other questions how does council wish to mr. mayor uh, I'd like to move to res uh, approve resolution 24020 acceptance of IDEQ planning and sewer overflow stormwater OSG grant sub award for the whole amount of thirty one thousand and five dollars second we have a motion a second further discussion on the motion Seeing none, will the clerk take the roll, please? Gookin? Yes. English? Yes. Wood? Yes. Evans? Yes. Miller? Aye. McEvers? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. And Chris, you're up again. All right. Last one. So uh, this ask is um, the Independence Point Stormwater Project. This was another DEQ um, funded project through Governor Little's uh, Leading Idaho um, initiative. And like the Sanders Beach and Mullen Avenue projects where we took some of the stormwater that was going into the lake and we put it into some filters and dry wells, this is the same uh, concept here. Um, we had hired Keller engineers to, or Keller associates to uh, do the design for this. We went out to bid for it. We got two success or two bidders on this one: Terra Underground and SNL Underground. Um, let me show you real quick. Uh, getting ahead of my slides, but this is the uh, the drainage area that flows into the Independence Point outfall which is here pouring into the lake when the water level was pretty low um, and this is uh, an example of one of the areas there are several areas that we're looking at uh, treating the water and this is just to reduce the amount that makes it down to Independence Point we can't take care of it all because it's a, a lot of acreage but we're essentially putting some new pipes and um, manholes in that have sumps in them so that they can lose some of their sediment in them before going into some uh, drainage trenches. And the way that we set this up, because we weren't sure that we'd have enough money, was we had 11 areas as part of the base bid, and then we had three more areas as um, bid alternates, and then we also had some um, asphalt paving as a separate ad alternate and temporary surface repairs. Um, and the reason for that is because, well, twofold. One is that there's a tight timeline for spending this money. We have to try to get it done by mid-June to ask for reimbursement because it's the end of their funding cycle with this money. Um, and we we're afraid that paving contractors weren't going to be available and would slow the project down. And the other reason is because we can pave patches in the road much cheaper than a contractor can. Um, we do it all the time for the water department, so we were looking at that option. So we went out to bid for this, and we got our two bids, Terra Underground and SNL Underground. And here was their base bid and all the ad alternates. Well, the ad alternates all totaled for Terra Underground, the low bidder, for $653,000, and we actually had about $850,000 in grant money left. So we would like to award the base bid plus all the ad alternates, um, and we are also going to look at uh, getting some help on inspection from Keller Associates, but I'll bring that back at another time. Um, 
but because we have extra money that we would be giving back otherwise. So with that, I would stand for any questions. Chris, the, the uh, difference between the bids is substantial. And, and um, you are comfortable that that lower bid will be sufficient to be able to complete the work? Yeah, there was actually another bid that fell in between them, but they were one minute late because they drove from Bonner's Ferry to submit their bid. <laughs> uh, kind of a bummer for them. But um, that spaced it out between yeah. those two, which made us feel more comfortable. And then we had a conversation with uh, Terra Underground because um, they said they had a, a new uh, estimator putting the bids together, but they had all reviewed it, felt comfortable with it, and they want to go forward with it and don't have any issues. So. Okay. Christy. Oh, Mr. Mayor, I would just uh, take note that the governor's assistant, Jake Geringer, is in the audience tonight. If you could tell the governor thank you, and we're going to spend all the money. <laughs> and we're, doing, we're on a very good project. Woody? Couple questions. So, Terra Underground, have they done any projects for us before? I don't believe they had. They've done work for wastewater and water. Wait, okay. okay. They've been around a long time. Okay. The other one is can you go back to that slide that showed where all the water comes from, that hole? Oh, this one here? Uh, no. Oh, yeah, the one on the left there? Yeah. So, are we still pushing all the water to the river or are you going to take pieces of it out along the way? So, it this goes into the lake um most of this will still flow there but it, it's in this area here that we're concentrating and we're just going to be reducing the amount that's going to the lake uh, there still will be water flowing out of that outfall but less than there is today so the water is going where um into uh subsurface uh units to discharge into the into the ground to okay. So underground. Yes. Dry wells or whatever you call those things. Yeah, there's a, a drainage trench that they've designed to help uh, accommodate more storm water, and then we've got dry wells in there also. And it just perks away is yep. the idea. Okay, thank you. So this design, or, or did I Yes, I'm done. So this design isn't as sophisticated as the treatment we're providing at uh, Sanders Beach <coughs> area? Um, we don't have the sand compost aspect of yeah. it, so it's not quite as sophisticated, um, but we do have a lot of sandy material in our ground anyway, so it is going to get okay. treatment. Thank you. Other questions? A motion would be in order. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'd like okay. to move to approval of 24021 of bid award and approval of contract with Terra Underground LLC for construction of Independence Point Stormwater Project. Second. We have a motion to second for the discussion on the motion. Hearing none, will the clerk take the roll, please? English. Yes. Wood. Yes. Evans. Yes. Miller. Aye. McEvers. Yes. Gookin. Yeah. Motion carries. Thank you. Would anybody like to move to adjourn? <laughs> So I'll move. move. Yeah, move to second. adjourn. Second. <laughs> Third. There's a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor respond with aye. 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 Opposed with nay. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Aye.